I recently left my job at a private hotel in a nearby town. In the past few years, I have worked as a housekeeper in more than one small establishment, and they all operated in your average pay-by-the-night type of way. This last place was a little different. Considering I'd become accustomed to the ways things had worked in the past, I wasn't expecting anything out of the ordinary. I suppose in hindsight, I could have paid a little bit more attention during my orientation. Referring to their guests as families should have been a clue. Although I'd heard of long-term living hotels before, the area I live is way too far down on the economic scale to have anything fancy as that. Just to find this job, I had to drive 50 miles south to a metropolitan area. Initially, I believed my new workplace was this type of business. The building itself was a bit older and verging on run down, but it appeared to have been recently renovated on the inside. The tenants were obviously wealthy and most dressed very well. This probably explains why the job paid so much and I was required to sign an NDA upon employment. I figured rich and powerful folks always guarded their privacy in such ways so I didn't bat an eye. However, the longer I worked there, the clearer it became, things weren't the way I'd thought. The first clue was the large number of young people coming in and out at all times of the day and night. Despite being accompanied by an adult, I got the impression they weren't with their parents. The poor kids never looked happy to be there, but I always hated visiting family at their age too. The few times I attempted to say hi, I was ignored and given a nasty look by the adults. Although their behavior struck me as a little rude, I didn't think much of it. I grew up in a small town where folks are much friendlier, but I'd always heard city people were rude, so I let it slide. It seemed wiser to just mind my own business and not rock the boat. I put my head down and did my job, at least until that became impossible. It was a normal Friday morning, around 10 a.m., and I was cleaning a tenant's room. I could hear a ruckus coming from the neighboring room, but tried to ignore it. A few minutes passed, and I completed my work. I set my little spray bottle caddy onto my cart and headed down the hall to the next room. As I passed the same neighboring room's door, I could hear what sounded like a child's screams. I was naturally concerned but didn't want to cause any trouble, so I ignored it and continued pushing my cart down the hall. I got about three doors down when I heard a door behind me, the very same one I'd heard the screaming coming from, thrown open. I turned around to see what was happening and saw a nude boy maybe 12, running toward me and screaming for help. It took a moment to process before I realized what I was seeing. The poor little child ran into my arms, begging me to save him. I reacted like any decent woman would and did my best to comfort him. Not 30 seconds after, a middle-aged gentleman came down the hall in a calm and smug manner. He approached us and tried to take the boy by his shoulder. I wasn't having it. My days of ignoring the strange things around me were over. Before he could get a good grip, I pulled the child away and asked him what was going on. The man gave me a disapproving sneer and told me to mind my own business. The boy looked up at me with a terrified stare and begged me not to let him go. There was no way I was going to and told the man so. He let out a frustrated huffing noise and said, Well, you just lost your job. I couldn't help but laugh. Even if he did have that power, I didn't care anymore. The degeneracy going on around me wasn't going to continue as long as I was there. I couldn't allow it. The man walked off and returned to his room, slamming the door behind him. I pulled a clean towel from my cart and covered the boy. We took the elevator to the lobby and I called the police. When they arrived, I explained what I had witnessed and answered some questions. While this was going on, my boss was sitting in his office watching with an angry snarl. A CPS worker showed up a little later and took the child with her. Once the police questioned everyone, I returned to my job. If I was leaving, my boss was going to have to fire me. About an hour later, that's exactly what happened. My boss called me to his office and informed me I had violated the privacy of a tenant and was being terminated. I was not sure how he expected me to react, but when I said, thank you, he looked surprised. Maybe he thought I'd beg. I left that office happier than I'd been in almost a year. I was eager to come home and share what I'd experienced until I remembered the NDA that I'd signed. Any happiness that I'd felt soon faded away. 
I feared those sleaze bags in that place would make everything disappear and the victimization would continue. Then the story broke on the local news and the hotel was shut down. I wanted to kiss everyone involved in its demise, but I had to settle on a few dozen roses and a thank you card. Although each of the offenders' charges vary and they probably won't go to trial for some time, my inside source is all but certain those that haven't copped pleas will be given at least 20 years just because of the nature of their charges. I'm not sure if I'm technically free from the restrictions of the NDA now, but I'll wager they have more important things to worry about. Hopefully all those monsters will get the full extent of what's coming to them, but perhaps more importantly, I pray all the children who were robbed of their innocence in that hellhole are able to get the help that they need to live some semblance of the happy life they've always deserved. From the day I started my first job, I worked hard with the future in mind. I was determined to give my children a better life than I had. You know, the American dream and all that. When I was fortunate enough to stumble upon my wife and we discussed what we wanted from a marriage, I would discover she had the same future in mind. As we jumped ahead to the arrival of our first child, we quickly learned that between work and taking care of the needs of a newborn, we had zero time to take care of small things like keeping the house clean. We had two choices before us, allow a stranger to raise our beautiful daughter or hire a housekeeper. Naturally, we chose the latter and called a maid service. The years passed and along with the birth of a second child, the housekeepers would come and go, some great, some terrible. Then we were sent Donia, and she quickly became part of the family. It only took a few months. She brought so much more to the family than just being a servant. The connection she formed with us all, but especially the kids, was priceless. They were calling her Grandma and Donia almost as soon as they could speak. About a year in, we asked her to come work for us, and for the next 15 years, she spent five days a week making our lives a bit less hectic. That's why her murder would hit us all so hard. This all goes back to 1993, a time before she had come into our lives. Donia met a man named Joe, and they had a son named Antonio. Their marriage wouldn't survive the century, but she, along with Antonio, would carry on as well as she could, sometimes working three jobs just to put food on the table. When she began working for us, Tony, as we called him, was still young. On the occasional days she was unable to find a sitter, we were more than happy for her to bring him along. He and the kids would play for hours, giving her the time to work unhindered. Unfortunately, as Tony grew older, he began getting in trouble with the law and banging heads with his mother. Tony was still coming along with Dania every now and then, but his attitude towards us had gradually soured and we learned to keep our distance. Our lives would be changed forever on a rainy February morning in 2015. I was the last out of the house for a change and I would left Dania to do her thing. According to later testimony, Tony had arrived about an hour after I would left. He was there to ask his mother for a loan, but she refused. He had borrowed almost a thousand dollars in the last few months and had not paid any of that back. An argument soon broke out and Tony became so angry he pulled a large chef's knife from our knife block and stabbed her multiple times, around 20 to be exact. Once he came to his senses, he fled and went into hiding. Perhaps the most horrible part of the attack was that Donia had not died instantly but instead probably lived another 10 minutes, left to slowly bleed out on our kitchen floor. Thankfully, it wasn't the kids who discovered her body. Instead, Melina, my wife, came home for lunch and found her. The paramedics were called, but that was just a formality at that point. Tony became the prime suspect almost immediately, and the police worked day and night to track him down. We were left to mourn her loss, a process I myself am still going through. I come to see Danya as a second mother and her death hit me like a truck. Tony was found eventually and given life without parole. Short of death, it's a sentence I'm happy with, but no matter the time he's given, we're never going to get Grandma Danya back. Life at home was never the same after Danya's death, and once our daughter moved off to college, Melina and I began looking for a new home. For the both of us, no matter where we looked, 
everything was a reminder of her death. Our one-time dream home had become a nightmare, a constant reminder of a young man's selfishness. When we finally found a buyer for the house, we took up residence in a two-bedroom condo on the beach. Life continued to drag on for a few more years, however, our son will be leaving for school soon and will be free to take the tour of Europe we've been planning for 20 years. We had hoped to bring Donia along, a present for being a loyal and loving member of our household. That is, sadly, no longer possible. Although she may not be able to join us in the flesh, I have no doubt she'll be there in spirit, looking down and guiding us just as she had all these years, sharing her love and making our family content and complete. While I wouldn't normally disclose my shortcomings, what happened to me on a business trip to Phoenix needs to be told. In the spring of 2007, I was sent as a representative of our company to Arizona. A convention of sorts, more like a large get-together, was being held. The company I worked for provided inks, specialty stationery, assorted other stuff for smaller bookstores across the country. It wasn't my dream job, but the bills got paid and I was able to afford the first new car I'd ever owned. My flight landed late on a Friday, and I spent the remainder of the evening in my room. I had a few beers and ordered a pizza, finally crashing around midnight. I rose with the sun and headed out just after 8am. It wasn't until 11.30am when I stopped to buy a coffee that I realized that I'd left my cash on the bedside table. I'd thrown it down after paying for my pizza and forgot about it. I'm one of those people that can't stomach putting six fifty on a credit card. Besides, my room was only three floors up. I knew it would only take a second. So, I ducked out and headed upstairs. When I arrived at my door, the maid must have just left my room. Her cart was sitting outside my neighbor's door and the towels that I'd left on the bathroom floor were gone, having been replaced with fresh ones. Also, the trash was empty and my bed had been made. Strangely, there was no sign of my money anywhere. Maybe I knocked it under the bed or something. I looked under every piece of furniture, even in the trash can, but it was nowhere to be found. The idea that the maid may have mistaken it for a tip crossed my mind. I went into the hall and found her, where she was doing something with her cart. Speaking in a voice as kind as I could muster, I asked if she had seen any money on my bedside table. I could tell she was unsure of what I was asking and restated my question in Spanish. A slight look of guilt flashed across her face. I thought my suspicions may have been proven correct and she had mistakenly believed it was for her. I felt bad and quickly followed up by saying that I was sorry for creating any misunderstanding. I usually left the maid's tip when I checked out along with a little thank you note. I then explained I'd left it there by mistake and needed it back. Because I felt so guilty, I apologized again. However, instead of laughing it off and apologizing like usual in an awkward situation such as that, she got a disgusted look and cursed me for accusing her of stealing. I knew darn well that she understood me. What she didn't realize was, when I mentioned the money, she had touched the pocket on her apron. Most people have some form of tell in their body language. I had been playing poker since I was a little boy with my father, and he taught me how to recognize them. Nevertheless, I tried one more time to diffuse the tension and explain that I wasn't accusing her of taking it on purpose. I thought maybe she was embarrassed, and this caused her to lash out. You don't have to be embarrassed. I'm not going to tell anyone. I ended with a slight chuckle. It did no good and she began yelling again, thrusting her hands in and out of her pockets. I'd had enough. She'd been given more than one chance to save face and get away without raising my suspicions. Her overreaction to my questions betrayed her guilt to me. I calmly said, If that's the way you want to play this, and headed toward the front desk. I asked to speak with the manager and was invited into his office. As clearly as possible, I explained the situation and my interaction with the maid. We talked with another for the next 20 minutes or so, during which she asked me several questions. At the end of the meeting, he called the maid downstairs and she joined us in his office. He informed her that I had made a complaint that she had stolen $46 of cash from my room. He then asked if she had and she denied it. She began defending herself, talking about her loyal service to the hotel and its clients, the entire time fiddling with her apron pocket, all but confirming my suspicions right there. When she finally stopped, I 
told the manager that I knew exactly what the money looked like and could prove she had taken it. She turned to me and screwed her face up into a sneer and let out a huff. Before I began, I let her know I derived no pleasure from what I was about to do. Then I began describing the bills. Two twenties, one five dollar bill, especially noteworthy because of the words Kilroy was here written on it with a blue ink pen and a one dollar bill with a tear spanning a quarter of the way down the center. I could tell by her expression she was beginning to get concerned. She kept quiet, avoiding any eye contact, just staring at her lap. I took a long breath before finishing my indictment. Oh, and one more thing. Almost 100% positive my money is hidden in her apron. This must have caught her off guard. Her head shot up quickly with a shocked look, only for her to bring it back down quickly when she realized what she'd done. The manager's gaze moved from me to her, her eyes now fixed on her fumbling fingers. Well, is Mr. Wallace correct? She said nothing, acting as if he had never spoken. I sensed his patience was beginning to wear thin. Answer me. The words blasted from his mouth and even caused me to jump slightly. He must have gotten through to her. She jammed her hand into the apron pocket and threw the money at me. I calmly picked up the bills and thanked her. The hotel manager then asked me to return to the lobby while he spoke to her alone. I agreed and took a seat facing the office door. They spoke by themselves for a few minutes before she stormed from the office, crying and walking out the front doors. I assumed he had fired her. Although it's not a result I wanted, I can't pretend to feel sorry for her. The manager then waved me over to his door and confirmed my suspicion. I have terminated her for theft. I just want to tell you once again how truly sorry I am for this. I can assure you this has never happened as long as I've been manager here and I'm determined it will never happen again. Because of the terrible inconvenience you've been subjected to, I'll be comping your stay and hope this awful event will not prevent you from staying with us in the future. At this point, I'd gone way past caring long ago. I thanked him for his assistance and headed back to my event. In no time, I put it out of my mind and made friends with a group of guys. Once the presentations ended for the day, we all hit the town. After a long dinner, the five of us decided to visit a gentleman's club or two. It was a blast, but by 1.30, I was wasted and looking for a place to lay my head. I had a cab drop me at the hotel and staggered up to my room. The last thing I can remember, I was fumbling with my keycard through foggy eyes. I eventually got the door open, and that was when I was jumped from behind. It really wasn't as much being jumped as getting knocked over the head and pushed into my room. I'm going to be honest here and say I never saw my attacker's face. I was already laying face down on the floor and since I lost consciousness rather fast, I never got a chance. While I consider myself somewhat lucky for passing out before most of the damage was done, the pain I was left with was just as bad. When I did open my eyes, my attacker had already fled. Turning over was a miserable undertaking. Breathing wasn't much easier. I had to crawl around on the floor to find my phone. In the scuffle, I must have dropped it and it slid under the bed. The pain I felt with every breath told me I probably had a pierced lung. A concussion was almost a given. The beating must have sobered me up. I had no problem telling 911 where I was. The paramedics got me relatively fast and I had to spend two and a half days in the hospital. Even after being discharged, I nursed several broken ribs and multiple other injuries for another month. If you've been paying attention, it won't take you long to figure out who I believed was responsible. Not that I think this diminutive little woman did the attack herself. She more than likely took her complaint to a male family member. No matter how much it irks me that it happened, I had no proof of her involvement and that's what I told the police. There's no way I was going to point the finger at someone I barely knew. Beside, there's always the off chance the maid had nothing to do with it. I had to return home with an aching body and no resolution to my case. I never expected my attacker or attackers would ever be tracked down, I guess. However, when it comes into my mind, even all this time later it still eats at me regardless. If I could offer everyone one small bit of advice based on my experience, I'd recommend growing eyes in the back of your head. The next time you anger a woman, your tale might not end as well as mine. The saying, 
Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned exists for a reason, even when they brought it upon themselves. I'm a prime example. I believe it was the summer before I started high school. My mom's cleaning company was short a maid or two. She figured it made more sense to make me work for my money rather than just hand over a bit every time I asked. Maybe she thought it would teach me the value of a dollar. I'm not sure. Whatever her motivations, I was hired to cover the phones. This was a test to see if I could handle the workload. I must have passed because I was moved over to cleaning once the school year began. Five days a week after school and all day, Saturdays, I followed her and the other girls around town cleaning people's homes and offices. This routine continued for four years of high school and college. At the end of it all, I had a business degree and a 50% piece in the company. Another ten years would pass and, as mom would step further away from the day-to-day -day running of the operations, I would take on more responsibility. Until one day when she handed me her keys and wished me good luck. The business became mine and, with it, all its headaches and heartaches. I never completely stopped going out on jobs. The work kept me fit and in good standing with my clients. If I told you I enjoyed the actual job, I'd definitely be lying. However, by the time I left high school, I'd become almost disconnected from it. After 20 years of cleaning toilets and kitchens, I figured I'd seen it all and nothing could ever get to me. That was until the call for the Pearson job. The man who called sounded like a kind and amiable old man, if not a bit spacey. It took a moment or two for him to get to his point and it sounded like a run-of-the-mill house cleaning gig. What I saw when I arrived sticks with me to this day. I was met at the door by the old gentleman and led to a bedroom. The acrid scent coming from the room punched me in the gut and caused me to retch. While fighting the urge, I balked at the horrifying image before me. It appeared as if a tub full of blood had been splattered all about the room. The bed was by far the worst, soaked in an almost purple-tinted goo. One wall appeared to have a vast spray of blood and gray matter coating it. The horror of it overtook me and I ran across the hall into a bathroom and barfed up my lunch. It took a few minutes to compose myself. I stormed from the bathroom and confronted the man about what I had just seen. He hung his head for a moment at first mumbling an apology, then looking up toward me, quietly allowing a tear to fall from the corner of his eye. I'm sorry, young lady. I know it's an awful sight. I should have warned you. But I was afraid you'd turn around and leave. My grandson. He took a long, ragged breath and began again. My grandson took his life this morning. He did it in that room. I can't even bear to go in there. I know it must be shocking, a shocking sight to see, but I didn't know who else to call. My insurance won't pay for it, and the other, uh, the other company I called, the one the police gave me the card for, they wanted far more than I could afford. I knew my wife had used your company many years ago, and I liked it. I guess, I guess I hoped you could help me. I wasn't sure what to say. I felt horrible for this poor man, but this type of work was way beyond my ability, not to mention my comfort level. Crime scene cleanup companies made more because they had to deal with bloodborne diseases and pathogens and had the proper chemicals to dispose of bodily fluids properly. We continued to stare at one another, unsure of what to say. His eyes were now filled with tears. It was obvious what I had to do. I asked the gentleman for the cleaner's card. I spoke to them a moment and hung up. Before I could get the words out, I began to get choked up myself. I cleared my throat and began once more. It's all taken care of, sir. Your family's been a good client in the past and it's the least I could do. At that moment, I didn't actually remember the family, but it seemed an easy way to explain what I was doing. Although right that second I wasn't sure why I was doing it. You don't have to worry about it. Consider it a thank you for the loyalty to our company. The old man's eyes lit up when I said this. His face was now one big wet mess. I don't know how to thank you, young lady. 
I didn't think there were kind people like yourself around anymore. He lunged upon me and wrapped me in a massive arms. I did the same and we stood there for the next minute locked in our mournful embrace. In an instant, we released one another and I bid him goodbye. I've sat down and tried to tell this story many times over the years. Somehow, I've always found some excuse to stop. I tried to convince myself it was too complex of a matter to explain in written form, but the real truth is that deep down, I'm a coward who's terrified of being punished for what I've done. I'm sending this in anonymously, as that should be a big clue. The story began in 2006. As a family, we'd been well off for several years because of my wife's flourishing vet practice, up until 1999, I'd been in corporate headhunting. I never enjoyed the work and had harbored a dream of going into business for myself. In October, I got the okay for my wife and started taking in jobs. I've been doing work on my off time until then and had converted a spare room into my workshop. Since I was the one at home all day, I was put in charge of replacing our housekeeper. I set up a series of week-long interviews and was beginning to lose hope. Then, after lunch on a Thursday, Sylvia arrived. I'll admit she stole my heart from the beginning. Her big brown doe-like eyes and innocent bearing blinded me to her lack of experience. In hindsight, I believe she caught on to this and got flirty with me to get the job. I hired her on the spot. The next twelve hours was agonizing. I couldn't think of anything other than her and I had a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach the entire time. Despite my obvious adoration for Sylvia, I had zero intent on sleeping with her. I loved my wife more than life itself, and I couldn't imagine doing anything to hurt her. That's the way it would remain for a long time. Regardless of my intentions, I would eventually give in to my desires. She had continued with her flirting. Something, at first, I saw as harmless. However, as the months passed, it became more brazen and I began fantasizing about her. Although I harbored an enormous amount of guilt, the fantasies continued until I finally acted upon them. We found ourselves face to face in the hallway. It only snowballed from there. Afterwards, I was left with nothing but guilt. I couldn't look my wife in the face. When we spoke, I felt like I was laughing silently at her and any attempts to act as if it never happened were thwarted by Sylvia. In her mind, we were now lovers. My attraction to her never waned, but our infidelity had made her designs clear to me. On one hand, I burned constantly with lust for her, but at the same time, mine and her actions made me sick to my stomach. When I informed her it would never happen again, she took the news poorly. At the same time, I got the impression she doubted my resolve. It didn't matter. I buried myself back into my work and did my best to avoid her. This worked out for the most part, but as time went by... I became mired deeper in guilt. I couldn't focus. Nothing took my mind from the wrong I had perpetrated upon my wife. It all came to head one evening before dinner. My wife was especially happy. Her joyful ignorance was eating a hole in me. I no longer cared what became of our marriage and fully expected to be thrown out on my tail. The truth spewed from my mouth like some form of verbal diarrhea. I couldn't look her in the face for a long time. When I did... I was shocked to see a smile on her face. This confused me and my expression must have shown it. She chuckled, then explained how she had all but expected it to happen. She wasn't happy it had, but knew me well enough to know I'd be consumed with guilt if I did it. We continued to talk for hours. By the time the next day dawned, our marriage had become strengthened, stronger than it had been in years. Now we only had one thing left to do. When Sylvia arrived at 8 a.m., we sat her down and explained the situation. We were going to have to let her go. The health of our relationship relied on it. She tried being smug, but her self-assured mask eventually slipped and she unloaded on the both of us. I had apparently led her on, tricked her into bed. My wife was also a deceitful cow. Neither of us lashed back at her. She was young and, after all, we'd kind of ambushed her. She finally stormed out of the house with the last of her pay and we assumed we'd never hear from her again. 
The wife and I, we'll call her Eve, began our new life together. Part of what had caused us to grow apart were Eve's long hours at work. She decided to bring in another vet to help out and her and I got to spend a lot more time together. For the first time in years, we tried to learn about one another's dreams and interests. I discovered Eve had long loved foreign films. We spent our evenings watching old Italian and Japanese ones, namely those by Kurosawa. Most of what I saw blew my mind. I told her about my fascination with photography. I could tell her enthusiasm for the subject was lacking, but regardless of this, she would assist me in the dark room developing my photos late into the night. I guess I should have expected something would get in the way of our fun. The phone call started. I answered them in the beginning. Sylvia came across as repentant initially. She apologized for the way she'd acted and asked if we could be friends. It didn't sound like a good idea and I said so. We left at that and I hung up. Things went downhill quickly after that. When Eve was the one who picked up the phone, she'd hang up. The last call I answered, Sylvia tried to get me to come over, threatening to end her own life if I didn't. I had no time for drama. I hung up and hoped she would eventually lose interest. It wasn't to be. The voice messages began and were shocking in their strangeness. One day she would be saying she was sorry for her behavior. The next she'd call repeatedly, cursing us only to beg for her job back the next. For the most part, we didn't take anything she said seriously. Then she went too far and began threatening my family. I know where your daughter goes to school. Even if she was full of it, I couldn't take the chance. She had shown over the past months how unstable she was becoming. Even I immediately made drastic changes to our lifestyles. Any pattern we'd had in the past was stopped. Perhaps the most important alteration was to our daughter's school. It may not have been the best time to do so, but her safety was my greatest concern. After having gone through all these safety measures, the phone call stopped. A month or more passed and we began to believe the danger was over. All of this activity just happened to coincide with the winter holidays. We celebrated Thanksgiving with my folks, returning home the following day. Eve's parents flew in that Saturday and agreed to look after our daughter so we could shop for her Christmas present. As usual, everything she wanted was impossible to find. We spent most of that day going from store to store. The sun was already beginning to set when we were headed home. I was the one doing the driving. We were about five miles from the house when I noticed a familiar looking hatchback following close behind us. No sooner did I see it, the car began ramming the back of ours. Eve, who had been sleeping in the passenger seat, jolted awake. The car rammed us once more before pulling alongside us. I was horrified to see it. it was Sylvia driving the car. A wild, crazed look crossed her face and she was screaming. Although I couldn't hear her words, the way she bared her teeth and spit made me shudder with fear. The ramming would continue, only now it was Eve's door taking the brunt of the damage. I did all I could to not lose control. The second contact caused the window to explode all over her face. The shards left tiny cuts on her cheek. The sight enraged me. Before I realized what I was doing, I cut the wheel to the right, smashing into Sylvia multiple times. On the last hit, she must have lost control. The car veered off the shoulder, suddenly disappearing from the roadway into a deep creek. Eve and I turned to each other, meeting eye to eye, but saying nothing. Then just as quickly our eyes broke away and focused back on the road ahead. No one spoke for the remainder of the journey and neither of us mentioned what had occurred to Eve's parents. We managed to avoid the subject until well after the new year. Now, with her parents no longer in the house, Eve felt it was time to discuss the crash. I was afraid she would want to go to the police, but we turned out to be of the same mind. Good riddance as far as I'm concerned. The way she said it gave me a shiver. I'd never heard her be so cruel. I didn't blame her exactly, but I feared the experience had made her bitter. I wasn't about to argue. There was no love in my heart for Sylvia. She could stay at the bottom of that ravine until the end of time as far as I was concerned. We considered the matter closed and tried to start our lives over one last time. And that's the way it stayed. At least until the dream started. I didn't need a shrink to tell me what was causing them. Eve had always known it. My conscience rarely lets me be. The past year has been one nightmare after another. That's the real reason why I'm here. 
hiding from her wasn't a possibility and she doesn't seem to be the same considerate person she once was. She no longer seems to understand why I have to do this. More than once she told me to let it go. I love nothing more than be able to and I hope that by sharing this story, even from behind in an anonymous account, I can relieve myself of this burden once and for all. Maybe then we can finally have the happy family I've always dreamed of. This is something I didn't find out about until a few years ago. It happened to my mom while she was in her early 20s. She had just moved out to Los Angeles from Arizona to pursue an acting career. In between cattle calls and waiting shifts, she was always on the search for a better paying job. A girl she met at an audition told her about this high-end hotel that was looking for beautiful young women to be housekeepers. Mom had this in her bundles, still does to be honest. Right after the audition, she headed to the hotel to see if the story was true. And true it was. The managers asked her to return for a second interview and at the end of it, she was hired. The pay was far more than she'd ever made before, but with it came some things that she had to get used to. Like any average American girl, she gets all giddy every time she saw a famous person. You can imagine in the position where you serve them on a regular basis, this might get annoying. After a talk or two from her boss, she had to learn to view stars like normal people. That would all blow over rather quickly, and the job became just like any other eventually. A few times, she hinted at some odd behavior coming from these people. While never being specific, her descriptions of the perpetrators all but identified who they were. For instance, a very well-known singer checked in with his also-famous wife, only to spend the majority of his time hanging out with kids. On another occasion, she accidentally caught a famous actor who was married to a beautiful actress in bed with a man. Perhaps the strangest aspect of this is they are members of a famous religion that's well known for frowning on such behavior. I grew up hearing tons of crazy stories like this. However, it wasn't until recently that I heard the craziest one, and it just happened to involve my mother. Mom had been at the hotel for around three years. She'd been in a few national commercials and took extra jobs as often as possible. The workday had been an average one, but she remembers it was unusually hot for some reason. She knocked on the guest door and received no answer. So, like usual, she entered the room to clean it. It was a suit-type setup where the bedroom is separated into its own area. Looking around her, nothing seemed strange. The main room was relatively clean, so she moved on to the bedroom. When she opened the door, she got a horrible sight. A woman, still in her nightgown, lay lifeless on the bed. It appeared that she had been strangled. Out of instinct, maybe, Mom rushed into the room to see if she was still breathing. She was leaning over the bed, searching for a pulse, when she was grabbed from behind. The attacker, a heavy-set man she didn't recognize, grabbed her by the throat with both hands. He pinned her down to the bed and started choking her. She said this was the moment she realized her life was over. She also remembered the feeling of pressure in her head, like it was about to pop. She lost consciousness much faster than she expected and recalled feeling relieved she wouldn't have to suffer much longer. That's when it went dark. She was shocked to wake up. At first she thought it was all a dream, somehow caused by the lack of oxygen to her brain. The only problem with this was the pain in her head and the difficulty she had breathing and swallowing. She searched the room for her assailant, but only her and the dead woman remained. She wasn't sure if she was out of the woods yet, so she stumbled out into the hall looking for help. At first, she tried to scream, but a gruff croak was all she could manage. Soon, a guest exited from the elevator and caught sight of her crouching at the end of the hall. He ran to his room and called the police. The paramedics arrived just before them and rushed her off to the hospital. Her next two days were spent there. Luckily, she wasn't left with any long-term damage except for a new, grittier edge to her voice. An edge I never considered strange. I knew she had smoked before getting pregnant with me and believed this to be the cause. As new facts came to light, the dead woman was identified as the wife of a low-level producer the same man who had killed her and attempted to do the same to mom. 
his name was released to the press and law enforcement agencies around the world. Despite an exhaustive worldwide search, no trace of the man was ever found. It's thought he escaped to Europe and faded away into the newly dissolved Soviet Union. A few officers are of the belief that he never made it out of the country, choosing to take his life out in the middle of nowhere. I personally don't care where he went to or is today. I just hope he never comes back and, if he's dead, I hope he burns forever. Can you blame me? High school was when I discovered it. The first time I visited a wealthy friend and saw they had things like maids and personal chefs, I knew right then I wanted to grow up to be rich. The famous part wasn't as important, but I wouldn't turn down the adoration of the public either. Another thing I found around the same time was YouTube. Being able to peer into millions of humans' lives every day intrigued me. I toyed with the idea of starting my own channel for a while, but didn't get around to it. When I discovered that you could make money doing it, I began taking it seriously. The thing that made me get off my butt was when I found out just how much you could make. I created my channel that same day. I then dedicated many hours to watching every video I could find outlining how to become successful. Many of these tips would pay dividends, and then some not so much. Either way, my channel grew into a somewhat successful venture within a couple of years. The checks I would get from AdSense would soon outpace those of my parents. So what did I do then? I did what every successful YouTuber does, and moved to LA. My house was a beautiful place on the beach. After spending a load on furnishing it, I realized I forgot something. My fantasy of having a housekeeper. My first call was to a maid service. I told them what I wanted, and two days later I got a call saying that they had found someone. The woman... A quiet middle-aged Latina arrived and got to work. Because of the language barrier, we didn't speak to each other very often. When we did, I got the impression she didn't like me very much. I wasn't sure if this was really the case since I couldn't understand what she was saying much of the time, so I gave her the benefit of the doubt. Things went okay for a month, but when I pointed out that she had missed some dust on a shelf, she had a violent outburst. What I think was cursing coincided with a weird stomping and shaking of her finger. This behavior, of course, scared me and I apologized. The apology seemed to calm her down a little and I gave her the rest of the day off. I didn't want to lose such a great maid so I decided to keep her around. When she returned, all appeared to be forgiven. She got to work and did a good job as usual. Life went back to being peaceful. We tried to avoid getting each other's way and nothing happened for almost two months. However, one day I couldn't hold my tongue. After using soap to clean something, she left a bunch of soap suds in the sink. I pointed this out to her and asked her to clean up after herself, that's all. Instead, she just stared at me for a few seconds and started snarling. All of a sudden, she exploded and grabbed a kitchen knife from the block. I made the mistake of not running. She slashed across my cheek and began cursing at me again. Now, I ran for my life. She was close behind me when I ran out the back door. I made my way toward the beach. No one was around to help me, so I waded in the water. I was hoping she couldn't swim. The salt water stung my face a lot. I hadn't gotten out very far when she tripped and fell. This looked like a good opportunity. Maybe she'd drown. I didn't actually care, and the surf began carrying her out. She tried to doggy paddle, but wasn't doing very well. It looked like my chance to get away, and I waded back onto shore. I ran from my neighbor's house and begged for help. A young woman let me in and asked what was happening. I was about to tell her when Mari saw my maid, appeared at the door and began banging on it. She tried to open the door, but it was locked. The young woman called 911. She must have seen this, and the maid ran away. I didn't see where she went, I was just glad she was gone. When the police showed up, I told them what had happened. Then the ambulance took me to the hospital to get my face fixed. I got stitches at first and a few days later went in for actual reconstructive surgery. This is the first time I realized I'd be horribly scarred forever. At the time, I figured my life was over. The doctor did a very good job, but the injury had obviously ended my YouTube career. After all, you can't exactly be a beauty YouTuber with a big gash across your face. 
The police would eventually find Marisol hiding at one of her family members' houses a couple of days later. She made a bargain with the lawyers for a sentence of five years. None of it mattered to me. The damage had been done. My only hope is that she doesn't hurt anybody else when she gets out. Since I didn't have a way to make money anymore, I packed up my things and moved back home. Now I spend my days watching other YouTubers and coming up with ideas for new money-making enterprises. Until I can afford to move back out on my own, I'll have to wait on getting another maid. For now, my mom will have to do. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Look at it anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, inflatable dolls don't have feelings. <laughs>